hello. I'm going to talk today about how to use your superpowers to transform people's lives. So first, let me introduce myself. Um, hola, my name is Alberto. Uh, I'm an engineer with the US Digital Service. And I'm originally from Puerto Rico, so my thoughts are in Spanish. Um, you may be asking, probably you're asking yourself, like, why? What are we talking actually about? So let's give a spoiler. Like, let's talk about government. Um, so this is healthcare.gov. Um, so this is a screenshot from a week ago. Open enrollment season is up, and you can go there and enroll for healthcare benefits. But it wasn't always like that. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, the Centers for Medicare was given the responsibility to develop a new website so citizens could go and enroll for benefits. Government officials did it the way they know how to do it. They stood up a big contract, they put millions of dollars into it, and they started gathering requirements for months. They built something. Fast forward October 2013, open enrollment season started, and users ran to the website. And it crashed. The system was down. It couldn't handle the load. Uh, that's how the website looked like for a while. So it would read, the system is down at the moment. We're working to resolve the issue as soon as possible. So a group of technologies from the private sector was called to help. They temporarily moved to Washington, more like Maryland, and started working on stabilizing the website. It was probably Conway's law at its finest. If you haven't heard about Conway's law, it basically states, organizations tend to design systems that replicate their own communication structures. So they got people in the same room, they started breaking their communication walls, and they implemented some monitoring tools that actually were like pretty badly needed, and got the website up. Citizens were able to get access to healthcare and benefits. So healthcare.gov has actually become like the modern poster child of government failure. Fast forward 2014, so part of that rescue team from healthcare.gov founded the US Digital Service. Their mission was simple. They wanted to recruit top designers, engineers, product managers, policy experts, and bureaucracy hackers, have them join in a tour of duty from six months to four years and anything in between, and put them to work with the nation's civil servants to untangle the most important government services. So today, this is where I work. The US Digital Service is a team of nerds across the federal government. And we use design and technology to deliver better services to the American people. But let's go back to that healthcare conversation we were having. So wh what, why does that matter, right? Like, what, what's the deal with a website? So, well, it's not about the tech, right? The problem is not the tech. It's about the impact on people's lives. So there are some stats from the health conference this year. Kudos to like Amy Gleason, a coworker, who live tweeted this because I wasn't there. And I'm going to share some of this. So over the past 20 years, US drug spending has increased by 330%. Health expenditures increases increased by 208% total US. Specialty drugs predicted to account for 55% of spending by 2020. Insulin increased in list price by more than 350% between 2002 and 2016. And medical costs are like one of the prime contributors in two out of three bankruptcies in the United States. So it meant that that website could make the difference between life or death. So said otherwise, like that website, website was important because the people are the mission. So I was talking about the USES, um, this team of nerds. So for the past 50 years, we've been working on multiple agencies across the federal government. I'm going to mention some of them so you get a sense of what we do. We have teams at the VA working with veterans to provide them access to their benefits. We have a team at the Health and Human Services, which is where I work today. We were transforming the delivery of care by modernizing the Medicare infrastructure and providing access to beneficiaries to their data. We have a team working to improve the path to our citizenship for new Americans and helping asylum seekers at the Department of Homeland Security. We have a team working at DOD, improving the life of military families. 
And we had a team of the Small Business Administration helping economically disadvantaged small business owners. And actually, this is what I, was, I want to talk about today. So I was part of the team that was sent to the Small Business Administration. I was the second engineer to join. And we worked there for more than two and a half years, transforming the experience for economically disadvantaged businesses. So, so that you get a sense. So this is the Small Business Administration. This is their mission. Their mission reads, to maintain and strengthen the nation's economy by enabling the establishment and viability of small businesses and by assisting in the economic recovery of communities after disasters. So the development administration basically have a bunch of programs. Some of them are aligned towards what we call government contracting and business development. And they fulfill the, the SBA mission the following way. So the federal government awards contracts. They have billions of dollars that get awarded every year. And they want to open that up to small businesses, especially small businesses that are started and owned by underrepresented groups. SBA sets goals so that agencies award a fixed percentage of their contracts to those small businesses. And then small businesses not only grow economically, but they grow and develop their business to education, partnership, and mentorship. This is what these programs try to do. So, Let's, let's show some numbers around that so we can gauge the impact. So the federal government awarded $120.8 billion to small businesses in 2018. That only represented 25% of all the contract money that was awarded by the federal government. And that was actually an increase on $15 billion more than previous fiscal year for small businesses. So that's a lot of money. So what are these programs that I've been talking about? Just to give you some more sense of how it works. So these are some of the SBA programs. You can go to sba.gov and read the details carefully. I'm going to go through all of them. But like in a nutshell, if you or someone you know start a business and you're either a woman, a service disabled veteran, or an economically disadvantaged minority, the federal government will prefer to contract you. SBA's role is to help you achieve so and make sure that government agencies do it. So one of those programs is actually the Hubson program. It stands for Historically Underutilized Business Zones. So basically, this is a very interesting program. Its role is to promote job growth, capital investment, and economic development in economically distressed areas. So companies need to comply with two main things. First, they need to have like their principal office in one of these like economically distressed areas. And second, they need to hire at least 35% of their employees from there. So the idea is to like drive dollars to the economy and grow those depressed economies. So I mentioned having like a building in one place and hiring from one place. So basically like if we were to simplify this a little bit, like hub zone equals a map, right? So let me show you, visually show you how it looks like. So this is actually where we're today. Um, so these polygons you see here from different colors um, are hub zone areas. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this is like Tennessee and some of the surrounding states. As you see, there's like many, many, many more hub zone areas. If you keep zooming out, this is the United States. I mean, well, part of it. This is the real United States. So you have like Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. So as you see, big portions of some states are big hub zones. So at this point, you're probably asking, like, how is all this determined, maybe? So basically, in order to qualify these areas, the Small Business Administration uses geographic and statistical data from multiple government agencies. They look for socioeconomic indicators like income, poverty, and unemployment to determine whether that area should be determined a hub zone. They aggregate this data at what the census calls county and census tract level. Finally, the SBA also identifies Indian lands, difficult development areas, close military bases, and areas hit by natural disasters to add them as additional hub zones. These data sets are updated multiple times a year at different intervals, depending on each source. And again, the idea is to drive economic activity 
to all these areas I mentioned. So I show you like that little pretty fancy map. But, well, it really wasn't like that when we joined SVA. So this is what we found. It was like we walked in and we found the lost cousin of MapQuest. <laughs> this is what the Small Business Administration was using until 2017. If we were to use two words to describe it, uh, the team would agree we would call it SATMAP. This actually became like our mascot. This became the mascot for our 500 error page on the new map. So it was pretty bad. So it had zero documentation. It had no version control. It had no APIs or web services. It wasn't mobile friendly. It took forever to load, actually. It was built using some proprietary geographic information system and a weird technology in the back end. It had very limited data export capabilities. And of course, some features require like a companion desktop client that you needed to install. So someone could be asking here, so why don't you ditch that and just, just get the data, right? Well, yeah, so we started digging deeper and then we found like the ring binder. So there was a binder full of CDs and basically it contained like the archive of hubs and data for all the years. It was in some proprietary format too. Um, we couldn't know which CDs were missing um, and not all of them were even labeled. So if this is what it looked like, how did that thing even work, right? How was it maintained? So let me simplify this. So a human would burn a CD-ROM containing some data in a proprietary format. That would be put into the mail. It would include an airplane. It would send like next day delivery. Hopefully it gets received in one or two days. And then more humans would do things with the received CD using computers, with servers, on the data center, not in the cloud. Then it would be deployed somewhere. So an SBA analyst would go open his computer and would manually test it somehow. And they would continue the, re the process and repeat indefinitely until it was ready to deploy or they had like a patch that needed to be applied. It could take up to six months to do a data update. But then, let's complicate things a little bit more. So it turns out that some of these hub zone areas actually expire. So by the time the data was published, well, it was actually out of date. So let's pause here. There was like a crazy roller coaster of things that we had to deal with. Um, and the truth is that the basic infrastructure that the agency needed was not there. Government partners didn't know how to fix it and they didn't know what was a better solution. There were like a lot more, me more things that we had to untangle and fix in order to like fix the hub sum up. But let's circle back to the user for a second. So how did this work for small businesses? So the short answer is like, it didn't. So if you're a hub zone small business owner, you would face the following situations. You had an out of date map, you needed to make, make business decisions about where to locate your business and where to hire from using inaccurate data. Basically, this could comprise like adverse economical impact for them. For example, one business owner was moving his principal office to a complete new location because his hub zone was expiring. And it turns out that the place he was going to move to was not going to be a hub zone either. So business were at risk of losing their contracts if they didn't stay in compliance with the program. And this translated to like an additional overhead. Like small businesses had to do like extra paperwork and do more checks and keep their own data records just to track whether they were hub zone compliant or not. So it could be definitely hard to grow a business under such conditions. So we fix it. So we modernize it. So I want to talk about like how we did it and the things that matter in the process. So you get a sense. So this is the new hub zone map. I want to give kudos to Tyler Bolchas, who's here. He was like, 
one of the core engineers working on this with amazing like design and front end superpowers. So I'm pretty proud of the work we did here. This wasn't about the tech actually. And this serves as a foundation for many other things that we did at the Small Business Administration to help other economically disadvantaged programs. This, is, this was built on Rails, um, and we used Ruby extensively to modernize all parts and components of the Hubson program. We helped the agency determine what services they just needed to subscribe to versus which ones they needed to just build and maintain. And that meant we needed to hack the way that traditional services were bought and purchased in government. So let me take you through the journey. So this is our map. So you would go there, type an address. We decided like the ANC should not build their own geocoding infrastructure again. Um, so we adopted Google services. So you could get Google Places and simplify your searching process. Once you have your address, it will take you there. And then you will see the address and the coordinate. And then you will see your hubs and qualification. So that sidebar there was like one of the most complex things to build. And it wasn't just because, it wasn't that we couldn't do JavaScript. Um, it was hard because like simple is hard. There was a lot of policy and a lot of complexity in this program and we needed to simplify this on that sidebar for users to make sense of it. It required thoughtful research and feedback with our users. It required restructuring the hubs and data so that we could get all the information needed to provide the right feedback to business owners. And it also required like, a lot of policy hacking. We needed to read and unpack the regulation with lawyers and designers in order to understand not only how policy should be implemented in software, but how information should be conveyed to users. You could also click anywhere, and you would see the information for the new place you selected. So geocoding is like, not perfect. Even the big companies tackling this problem have not perfected it. We quickly learned that in some rural areas and jurisdictions like Puerto Rico, geocoding is like far from perfect. As we iterated, we implemented some reverse geocoding mechanism so that an SBA analyst could get an approximate address in cases when he was doing business compliance. We needed to look into our users. We not only had different personas for small business users with different needs and expectations, but we also had internal government users for whom this became their primary tool. Simplicity required calculating hubs and expiration dates. So you see all these layers with all these formats. So there's like multiple expiration dates that could be on multiple layers that are overlapping. So we needed to remove the noise in cases when the expiration date from one area didn't really matter, like this one, right? When you see in the sidebar, there's like a redesignated county. It expired December 31st, 2021. But like, there's also a census track in there, and it doesn't expire. So we just needed to tell users, hey, you don't need to care. You're qualified. And then this tool was used and made, was used and made an impact for users on vulnerable communities. I mentioned Indian lands and other places that the Hobson program tries to foster development. So areas hit by major disasters are one of those. So this tool could help not only rebuilding a community, but like rebuilding a business. And policy can be complex. So sadly, policymakers usually don't have a technology in the room to help translate words in regulation to software. Or from stopping them from adding the wrong language to the written policy. In this case here, like we have like a redesignated county. But Hurricane Irma and Matthew actually affected this area. Based on the way that hub zone qualified disasters areas are designated, and due to the complexity stemming from the written policy, this area could actually become a qualified disaster area in the future or remain hubs and remain hub zone for many years, or it could very well not. So we had to find the right balance between not telling users what was happening versus trying to simplify the language and the policy and all the concerns that were coming from the agency stakeholders about conveying information that could be misleading. We put a lot of effort writing in plain, simple language, uh, making our tool accessible to users. We designed and tested our solution with blind users to make sure it was software compliant and accessible. Being a visual tool, 
We even checked for color blindness so that all users were included. So our technical strategy was like quite simple. We just built a spatial data pipeline. We used Rake and a lot of Ruby tools to do this. Rake was super useful to translate policy step by step into our data ETL. Being a geographic data system, we use Postgres, PostGIS, GeoServer, and many other tools and some gems to process and render our geospatial data. And we worked really hard to automate things out of this, at that pipeline. We adopted an API-first architecture. It became pretty evident since the beginning that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel on many services. And government's not good about building software, so we wanted to subscribe to commercial products when it makes sense and be very intentional about the software that we were building. We had to think about the use cases, the different system interaction, and all the other developers potentially using our tools in order to get a better building, get better at building APIs. From our hubs and a specific API to the API that generated PDFs using Prawn, that was fun using Prawn, uh, to the other internal and ex external services our app interacted with, everything was an API. And we wrapped up everything in a single app, Build with Rails. So we adopted the US Web Design System, which is a design system built by ATNF, another government agency, uh, that is designed with accessibility in mind. And we slowly evolved evolve into our own design system. We added many features from like sharing hubs and locations to even implementing Street View to help an SBA analyst do a site visit. Basically, SBA analysts need to go to the field and find, visit the principal offices of these businesses. So at times they don't know where to go, or the address doesn't properly geocode. So we use uh, Google Street View to basically provide an alternate way to do kind of a virtual site visit. And we adopted the cloud. We started building what became the foundation for site reliability engineering culture at the agency. And we adopted infrastructure's code paradigm at the agency too. We built some tools for that. And we worked together with other projects, especially the SBA.gov team to standardize our tools and think about scaling and managing our cloud instances in collaboration. And finally, we established a framework at the agency to open source software. This is code.gov, a government initiative to foster collaboration and reuse of code in the federal government. So we sat down and put together a process so that other teams could adopt, that other teams could adopt and start open sourcing their work. You can go there and see like many more projects that the SBA has been opening up. So in case you haven't got the hint, let me be very clear. Like you can do this, you can do this job. Um, government doesn't need complex solutions that implement like all the buzzwords. It needs nimble solutions designed with users at the center. Government definitely needs better experiences. But actually, this is not about government. It's about citizens. Citizens need better experiences. They deserve better experiences. And for some, it could mean life or death or growth of their communities and the commonwealth. So all our users are represented here in the teams that we work. But there's more. And we need people to come and do a true duty to help citizens. So you're probably asking yourself right now, how can I do this, right? If I just want to, t so I just want to tell you where you could start looking at. So this is Code for America. Has anyone heard about Code for America here? So basically, this is a nonprofit organization um, that was created, and they started with a fellowship program sending technologies to government to work on open source projects at different cities. And then they also were creating brigades that basically got together technologies, citizens, and local government to transform their cities. They have built a network of brigades all over the nation, and they're actively working on improving their cities. So if there's not a brigade, you could start one. And this is the best way to start making an impact. You know your problems better than anyone, and you know the people that suffer them too. I had the opportunity when I was in Puerto Rico to be part of the founding team of COPE for Puerto Rico. And we worked very closely with the state government back then to integrate their data, open data portal 
with services and prototypes that citizens were building. And then imagine Code for America, but like international, right? So this is Code for All. Code for All is a collaborative network made of organizations from all over the work. As you can see, it includes Code for America. And basically, it is the umbrella for all the nationwide Code for America brigades, you could say. There's Code for Japan. There's Code for Australia. Code for Brazil. There's some initiatives in Mexico. There's Code for Canada. So you can also collaborate with civic technologies if you're not in the United States. And then this is the US digital service, right? So if you are in the United States, you can work at the US digital service. So as I mentioned, we do a tour of duty. And you can join and work from six months to four years and anything in between. And we need to represent America as diverse as it is. So we hire from all over the place, even from Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Island. We need people to come and continue to bring their voice and their perspective of the world to the way we build services for Americans. I put here some stats about our leadership. Um, we try to be a diverse culture, so we're serious about looking at ourselves. So these are some stats from uh, our gender stats from our leadership. So basically, 58% of our leadership are female. Um, we're pretty proud about that. And 44% of our staff self-identifies as female, too. And then there's ATF. So if you, if you know about the General Services Administration, it's an agency that provides services to government, like from building, like construction and buildings to like buying cars and planes. So they have the Technology Transformation Service, and under the Technology Transformation Service, ATF exists. So they're like an internal consultancy shop that other government agencies can hire to help them build modern software, put in centers, putting users at the center. They're remote friendly, so if you wanna, don't want to come to DC to join USES, like they hire all over the nation remote first. Actually, they're gonna be looking for the next director of engineering, so if you're interested, like you should check it out. And then there are initiatives at different states. So I'm putting here the Colorado Digital Services, because actually like a former team member from HHS just left to start this venture. Um, so the governor wants to start a digital service initiative over there and transform the way digital services are developed and exist at the state level. There are multiple initiatives like this. New York City has an ECTL that's looking to hire San Francisco has an innovation office. Other government agencies in California are looking also for great talent. So there are multiple initiatives in different states where you could help transform the life of citizens. There's also some fellowships. So this is the Presidential Innovation Fellows. So this is a program that pairs talented, diverse technologies and innovators with top civil servants and change makers working at the highest levels of government to tackle some of our nation's biggest challenges too. They actually live under GSA today. And you can do like one year of service with them and go to an agency and transform the way things are built and developed for users and bring your talent to that. And then I also mentioned earlier like policymakers don't actually have technologies at the table, right, most of the time. So there's like some folks trying to change that. So this is Tech Congress. Tech Congress gives talented technologies the opportunity to gain first-hand experience in federal policy making and shape the future of tech policy. So basically, things are import important things are happening today in our country. So if you want to have a seat at the table and transform the way policy is shaped and think about digital in the digital age, you can do this tour of duty and support that. And maybe you're not like still like in the job market, um, and you're like just like either a graduate student, an undergrad. So there's coding it forward. So they're like an internship program for students, 
And they also work with government agencies and partners to pair them to transform pressing problems in federal agencies. This is a great program. So they not only bring interns to government, but they also look for technologies that could serve as mentor to those interns. I had the opportunity to do that, and this is like a great experience I would recommend to anyone. So, if I haven't convinced, if Ruby, if government was like an object, we really need to monkey patch government to have it work as, as intended. I hope you join us. Thank you.